put me at a double uh, disadvantage today. I first of all have to come after both Alistair and Ryan Hilda, um, who are two of the smartest people I know. Um, and secondly, um, to speak about Alistair's very fine report, which I, I honestly and sincerely thought was excellent. I'm tempted to cede my time and tell you all, go home and read, read this study. Um, there's an enormous amount of wisdom in it, uh, both expressed uh, directly but also indirectly. Um, it ha- there happen to be things I agree with, which are not necessarily the normal position uh, that you hear on these issues around town. And that's maybe a little bit uh, what I want to uh, want to talk about, what your study tells us, Alistair, that's different from conventional wisdom in Brussels. Um, I think there's been an awful lot of scare, scaremongering over the new economy, over what artificial intelligence is, over what it means, and in particular over what it can do. I, I've, I've, I've pondered this a long time, trying to understand why people were so scared of this. And I think the answer are all these science fiction movies we've seen. Uh, we, we always see on television these computers and robots have taken over and they're bossing us around like in 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, and I happened to see a recent episode of Dr. No where an algorithm had taken over the spaceship, which I, I thought was actually a, a very timely a sort of theme, given the way people think about these things. Um, but the evidence to me is, is a little bit different here. Um, I, I really don't think, even as smart as they've become and are still to become, that machines are going to be replacing people. Uh, they can already do cognitive functions better than we do. If you give them a math problem to do, uh, humans can't remotely compete with that. Um, on certain things to do with visual recognition, they're also extremely good. This is why they're so excellent for medical services, because they can actually read an X-ray better than a human being can. But the doctor still has a role in this process. If you, for example, you're diagnosed with cancer, God forbid, but if you are, you're not going to want a machine to treat you. You're going to want a human being to be there. And I use that metaphor deliberately because that's what I think is happening. I think that these machines are coming into the economy, and they're going to have a tremendous impact, but they're not necessarily going to replace us. They might replace some people who don't know how to operate them or live with them or make the most of them or take advantage of them, but I'll argue in a moment that that's going to be easier to do than I think people thought. Um, Or maybe I'll argue that right now since we're on the point. I I, I have um, a seven-year-old son, and from the time he was two years old, uh, he understood how to operate an iPad. It's all intuitive. Um, And I don't know if any of you have... um, taken coding classes recently. I, for for my sins, um, and I am getting old now, uh, learned how to code a really long time ago, about 30 years ago, when I think it was COBOL or BASIC or something they were teaching in after after school classes. And it was unbelievably boring. You couldn't really make the, you know, you have to spend an afternoon trying to write a program, and by the time you were done, your program was, you know, to make a, the computer print out the word hello, and everyone was very excited when it, um, when it finally did this. If you've been to any coding classes recently, it's all modular now. And my former two-year-old, now a seven-year-old, just zips these things around and makes his robot uh, do things. It's, they're, they're left, um, the machine has made that, that easier too. And I say this is very important because a lot of people think that people are going to have to learn how to be master programmers to operate an assembly line. I don't think that's the case, but I do think they will need to develop some familiarity with it. So what I wanted to say is I completely agree with you. I very much appreciate a theme throughout your report that you didn't mention so much in your remarks here today, but that I think is very important, uh, which is that this is a transversal issue. These technologies are going to touch on everything. They're going to touch on all of us in very new and very unusual ways. Now, Now, what do I mean by that? How do we respond? Well, I think the first priority needs to be that we need this. We live very well here in Europe. We have the most expensive workforce in the world. We have some of the most generous social benefits. This is all very expensive. We need to be at the forefront of the global economy. And by the way, more often than we give ourselves credit for, we are. The risk is that we lose that, that we don't embrace this technology quickly enough. This is why what you had to say about diffusion is so important, Alistair, because there is evidence that we're not absorbing these technologies as quickly and effectively um, as as we need to. So the first thing we need to do is accept that we need it. That involves a change of tone. Because right now, most of what I read scares me. I've been to conferences like this where I get a question such as, 
which of the hysterical estimates of how many people are going to lose their job to AI do you believe in? Is it the 10% one, the 30% one, or the 50% one? Well, I, I don't believe any of them, frankly. I do think there's going to be some job shifting and some job losses in certain places, but I don't think Armageddon is coming unless we're so stupid as to ignore this. And I, by the way, I don't think we're ignoring it. We're having a very nice conference about it here today. So I think we need it. We need a change in tone. Secondly, we need to bring people along with us. And let me be very clear what I mean by that. I'm not just talking about better communication, although we do need better communication. We need to show and express and articulate that we understand what's happening here and it's difficult. And that means what? First and foremost, lifelong learning. We have an educational system that essentially from the time you're 22 stops. Everything in our education system is front-loaded. And if you're like me, you're stuck knowing basic from 30 years ago. Um, We need to find ways to open the education system up so that people can go in. And by the way, Short term, people don't need to go in for four years. They can go in for six weeks, for three months. Find a way to make vocational training a a reality Um, and not just an afterthought, um, but something that people will go for. Um, Alistair, I don't have to tell you because you used to be on the PISA team here. I mean, when you look at, and this, this fits with some of the other statistics that you cited too, when you look at who's getting the education and training, it's the people who need it the least. And this is maybe no accident because the people who need it the least are the ones who are smart enough to know they need the education and training. We need to find a way to reach beyond the current cohorts that qualify for these things and, and, and create a genuine knowledge society. Um, I think maybe on that note I'll leave it there, um, uh, although there are quite a few other things that I could comment on um, in your presentation. Um, it really is an excellent report. How, have any of you here seen the film Sunspring? Have any of you heard of Sunspring? When you go home tonight, Google it. Um, Sunspring is a film that some, some scientists in California, uh, they fed all of the scripts of the 1990s uh, into this AI machine and had it study them for the perfect script and then write one. And a director made it into a film. And I'll just say one thing about the film. It's going to be a long time before AI is writing scripts because it's really just a complete mess. Um, <laughs> And it, and it, but it nicely illustrates the difference that I'm trying to talk about here. I mean, yes, machines can compute, uh, but they can't think. And there's still a very important role for us as human beings here. It's on the creative work. It's on the values. It's on sorting through this mess in ways that machines just simply can't do it. And I've no doubt that we're going to do it. What I'd like to see is us do it a little more quickly and lead the world on this here in Europe because the, the future of our economy and our society depends on it. And that's on that note, I'll stop. Thank you.